Good morning, everybody, and the subcommittee will come to order. Um, and I'll start with my opening statement. I've called to order this subcommittee's first hearing on cybersecurity and critical infrastructure protection. Over the last 15 years, our federal government has wrestled with the question of how best to protect our nation's critical infrastructures from cyber attacks. Since September 11th, our infrastructure system have become even more automated and more reliant on information systems and computer networks to operate. This has allowed our system to become more efficient, but it has also opened the door to cyber threats and cyber attacks. Recent reports and news articles have highlighted how threats and risks to cybersecurity have created vulnerabilities in our nation's critical infrastructures in information systems. For example, just last week, the Department of Homeland Security sent out a bulletin about potential insider threats to utilities. That bulletin stated that outsiders have attempted to obtain information about the utilities infrastructure to use in coordinating and conducting a cyber attack. In March 2011, the computer system of RSA were breached. RA, RSA manufactures tokens for secure access to computer networks. Sensitive information about these tokens was stolen and later used to hack into the network of Lockheed Martin, a Department of Defense contractor. Last summer, Stuck, Stuckneck attack was identified. Stuckneck targets vulnerabilities in industrial control systems such as nuclear and energy to gain access to the systems and then manipulate the control process. This kind of attack has the potential to bring down or severely interrupt the functions of an electricity or even a nuclear power plant. The issues surrounding critical infrastructure protection and security are complex. Our systems are interconnected and depend on depend one other depend on one other to operate. A vulnerability in one critical infrastructure naturally exposes other critical infrastructures to the same threats and risk either because they are linked together through information systems or because one infrastructure depends on another to operate. In addition, much of the country's critical infrastructures are privately owned, as much as 80 or 90 percent. They therefore have different operations, components, and control systems, and computer networks, as well as vastly different resources available to address problems like cybersecurity and infrastructure protection. My colleagues, we must identify and protect the very systems that make our country run. Energy, water, health care, manufacturing, and communications. Pursuant to the Homeland Security Act of 2002, DHS has led the coordination of infrastructure protection efforts with the private and public sectors and numerous federal agencies. One way DHS does this is to coordinate working groups and information sharing and analysis centers or ISACs in the individual critical infrastructure sectors and in cross-sectors working groups. DHS is primarily responsible for conducting threat analysis and issuing warnings about cyber threats so that other federal agencies and the owners and operators of critical infrastructure can simply protect their systems. DHS's efforts to protect our critical infrastructure have been the subject of some criticism. Since 2003, the Government Accountability Office has designated, quote, protecting the federal government's information systems and the nation's cyber critical infrastructure, quote, as a high risk, end quote, area. In particular, in a report issued last, G last July, GAO has found that public and private sector owners and operators of critical infrastructure were not satisfied with the kind of cyber threat information they were getting from DHS. GAO has also expressed some concern that the sector-specific plans for dealing with cybersecurity need to be updated. In light of growing and more sophisticated cyber attacks, this is obviously a critical issue. As I mentioned previously, this is the subcommittee's first hearing in this Congress on critical infrastructure protection and cybersecurity. The purpose of this hearing, in particular, is to get an overview of DHS's role and responsibilities and how it coordinates with the sector-specific federal departments and agencies, many of which are subject to this committee's jurisdiction. Once we have a better understanding of DHS's role, 
is my intention to call additional hearings to understand the issues that are presented in protecting the individual sector such as energy and information systems and communication many ideas have been presented about how to improve critical infrastructure protection and cyber security i believe the oversight investigation subcommittee has an important role to play in examining and bringing to light what is working now and what can be done better i should note that this subcommittee's inquiry into this matter began with a bipartisan letter to the department of homeland security asking for a briefing about its efforts to protect critical infrastructure i appreciate the support of the ranking member mr get and the minority in this investigation as members of congress one of our foremost responsibilities is protecting our nation's security and the safety of its citizens with that i yield uh, opening statement to the ranking member mr get thank you very much mr chairman and um, like you i'm uh, this is a matter of great urgency i'm glad we're having this overview hearing and i'm also happy to work with the majority on additional hearings into particular issues of cybersecurity. <coughs> um, just today in the Washington Post, it talked about a GAO, here, a, a GAO report on significant breaches of classified computer networks in the Department of Defense. And while that's not, while that's not in the jurisdiction of this committee, it just points out how vulnerable this country can be and why it's so important to keep our information systems safe. Um, the chairman referred to the cyber attack on RSA, which um, caused compromises to Department of Energy systems that necessitated shutting down internet connectivity for several days, and breaches of Citibank data belonging to hundreds of thousands of customers. Um, anecdotally, at least, it seems like these breaches are becoming more and more frequent. The incidents remind us of the need for vigilance regarding efforts to prevent cybersecurity breaches and respond effectively when they occur, and the importance of congressional oversight in these areas. Um, as the chairman mentioned, I asked um, him earlier this Congress to look into these issues, and I'm really glad that we're going to have a rigorous review of all of the cybersecurity issues. Um, as the chairman mentioned, we have jurisdiction over a number of key components of our nation's critical infrastructure, including the electrical grid, drinking water system, chemical plants, health care system, and telecommunications activities. In the last Congress, we saw progress in this committee uh, regarding addressing cybersecurity issues in a number of these areas. The committee developed and passed on a bipartisan basis legislation to promote security and resiliency in the electrical po power grid by providing the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission new authorities and providing for Department of Energy assistance to industry to protect the grid against cyber threats and other vulnerabilities. The committee also developed and passed legislation regarding chemical and drinking water facilities to meet ba risk-based cybersecurity performance standards. Cybersecurity issues are complex and evolving and deserve continuing and focused um, attention. One major question is how to best ensure an effective public-private partnership to address cybersecurity threats. The majority of our nation's critical infrastructure is owned or operated by the private sector. While there are incentives for private sector entities to protect the security of their information networks, national security priorities may not always align with priorities and capabilities of the private sector. I know that the Department of Homeland Security witnesses before us today are helping lead the administration's efforts to foster private and public sector cooperation in promoting cybersecurity, and I look forward to hearing their insights on progress that's being made and obstacles that may still exist. Another question we have to ask is how to best ensure that the federal government is drawing on its own expertise and experience to ensure cybersecurity measures are appropriately tailored to address specific needs in different critical infrastructure sectors. I look forward to hearing from GAO about these challenges. But even with a maximally effective partnership among federal agencies, state and local governments, and the private sector in our country on cybersecurity protection, we must still address issues raised by the fact that information networks 
do not have national boundaries many reports suggested that the cyber attacks have started outside of american borders raising serious questions about how we ensure international cooperation to protect against threats that cross borders and in this in this d o d example in the g a o report today apparently the cyber attack came from a portable computer a laptop computer bill computer that was somehow tapped into and so i look forward to the insights of today's witnesses on these and other issues i hope that we will build on this hearing with additional hearings on cyber security it's one of the few bastions of bipartisanship left around here this week and i'm happy to be part of it i yield back thank you gentle any recognize the gentleman from texas dr burgess for two minutes i think the chairman to say that this committee has been working diligently for years is kind of an oxymoron, but it does seem through through several terms on this subcommittee, we have indeed delved into this issue. I'm anxious that we bring this to a legislative conclusion and institute those things that will provide the protection that I think we all feel that we need. There are critical, urgent things that need to be done to protect our transmission grid, our power plants, from attacks from those who wish to do us harm. The threats are real. It is time to move the legislation forward. We do have to be careful that we don't unduly shift the balance of responsibility that has been properly maintained between the government and the private sector for decades. It is important that we be careful. It's important that we be prudent in providing the federal government any additional authority. If indeed any is necessary, it must be done in a way that cannot be abused and will not result in significantly higher cost to consumers and businesses at a time when the economy is so fragile and it must not result in the loss of any personal freedoms that people now have. The testimony we hear today will help this committee in perfecting legislation that was considered last year. I certainly look forward to working on members of both sides of the dais to ensure that the legislation is mindful of both the real threats that we face and the burdens that granting new powers to the federal government can create. Ensuring this balance can and should be done. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for the recognition, and I'll yield back my time. The gentleman yields back, and uh, the gentlelady from Tennessee, Ms. Blackburns, re recognized for two minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I want to welcome our witnesses. We appreciate that you would take the time and come over here to the Hill. We all do know and do agree that cybersecurity is an important issue, and we know that there are those who are, as we speak, waging war, if you will, on our vital infrastructure. Uh, last month, Wall Street Journal reported that the IMF was investigating a recent cyber attack. Not surprisingly, this attack came just one month after a group called Anonymous indicated its hackers would target the IMF website in response to the strict austerity measures in its financial package for Greece. Closer to home in my state of Tennessee resides our nation's largest public power utility, the Tennessee Valley Authority. TVA's power networks stretch across 80,000 square miles in the southeastern U.S. and provide electricity to more than 8 7 million Americans. Under Homeland Security Presidential Directive No. 7, TVA is considered a national critical infrastructure and must take great steps to protect and to safeguard its essential cyber assets. A power grid disruption or other threat on TVA operations or any other public utility in our country would cause a cascading effect impacting our economy, safety, and daily lives. In fact, this concern was reaffirmed last month as former CIA Director and current Secretary of Defense Panetta appeared before the Senate Armed Services Committee and declared that the next Pearl Harbor our nation confronts could very well be a cyber attack that cripples our power systems, the grid, our security systems, our financial systems, and our governmental systems. With all that in mind, I thank the chairman for the hearing. I thank you all for your participation as we discuss what steps DHS is taking to avoid what would be the unimaginable, a Pearl Harbor attack on our nation's vital infrastructure. And I yield back. Gentle lady yields back and uh, recognize Ms. Christensen uh, from the Virgin Islands for, for uh, five minutes. <laughs> 
Thank you, Chairman Stearns, and thank you, Ranking Member Duguette, for holding this hearing to discuss cybersecurity risks, threats, and challenges to our nation's critical infrastructure. Many of today's battles are in cyberspace, where terrorists and hackers help attack our cell phones, computer grids, and have the potential to destroy sensitive information and in our 18 of our critical our nation's most critical sectors. Since 9-11, we have known to expect that we would experience terrorist attacks that would be cyber attacks. As a former member of the Homeland Security Committee, I've taken part in many hearings and worked on legislation addressing this issue. As our witnesses who we welcome here today will testify, a lot has been done to create entities to coordinate and oversee efforts to address and prevent cybersecurity threats. But there are still challenges to protecting our nation's infrastructure from these threats, and we must continue to examine how we can overcome these challenges. In doing so, it's important that we pass legislation to protect our nation's electric grid. All of these long-term initiatives require a national electric grid that is reliable and secure. The electrical grid serves more than 143 million American customers, has to operate without interruption, and is a key foundation of our national security. Designing and operating an electrical system that prevents cybersecurity events from having a catastrophic impact is a challenge we must all address. And I want to add that the healthcare sector is not immune from these attacks either. So I'd like to um, thank DHS and GAO and commend both agencies for their efforts to address imminent cybersecurity threats. And with that, I'll yield back the balance of my time, Mr. Chairman. The gentlelady yields back, and uh, at this time, we'll uh, move to our, our first uh, panel, our witnesses. Uh, let me address you folks. Uh, you're aware that the committee is holding an investigative hearing, and when doing so, has had the practice of taking testimony under oath. Do you have any objections to taking testimony under oath? All right, no. The chair then advises you that under the rules of the House and the rules of the committee, you are entitled to be advised by counsel. Do you desire to be advised by counsel during your testimony today? All right. In that case, if you please rise and raise your right hand, I'll swear you in. Do you swear the testimony you're about to give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth shall help you die? Right. You're now under oath, subject to the penalties set forth in Title 18, Section 1001 of the United States Code. We welcome the three of you and uh, for your five-minute summary uh, statement. And we have uh, Ms. Bobby uh, Stemfrey, Acting Secretary of the DHS Office of Cybersecurity and Communications. Welcome. And Mr. Sean P. McKirk, Director, National Security, Cybersecurity, and Communications Integration Center in the Office of Cybersecurity and Communications at DHS. And lastly, Mr. Gregory uh, Wilshosen, Government Accountability Office, Director of Information Security Issues. Thank you. And uh, Ms. Stempley, we welcome your opening statement. Just turn the mic on if you don't mind. Just move it close to you so we can hear you. That'd be super, thanks. Great, thank you very much. So thank you very much, Chairman Stearns, Ranking Member Deguette, and other members of the subcommittee. Um, as, as you heard, my name is Bobby Stemfley, and I am the Acting Assistant Secretary in the Office of Cybersecurity and Communications at the Department of Homeland Security, and it is definitely my privilege to be here to speak to you today with my colleagues from across government uh, to talk about cybersecurity, which is an, an uh, area of great passion for all of us. Um, the opening comments were uh, did, did such a wonderful job describing the threat landscape that we operate in today. It certainly is one with increasing sophistication, increasing severity, and an environment where no one is immune from um, individuals to private sector companies, um, and one where uh, we see it uh, slightly untenable, where the uh, threat actors have to make one right choice um, in an environment where only a single wrong the wrong implementation in the uh, in the the networks that are being defended enables access and so it is an environment where we spend a great deal of time bringing together uh, private sector partners and others we have identified 38,000 vulnerabilities over a period of time in critical infrastructures um, and provided warning notification and awareness products around those vulnerabilities to private sector and individuals it is an environment as the chairman pointed out of significant interdependence um, both between critical infrastructure sectors between corporations uh, between environments the uh, several examples that you provided do 
a wonderful job illuminating that interdependence across the board. And that means that it requires an interdependent and integrative approach um, in order to provide productive, preventative, and uh, restoral and defensive measures both across government and within the private sector. It is the job of the National Protection and Programs Directorate. Um, it is our mission responsibility to secure the federal executive civilian branch, um, that is the federal departments and agencies, to provide technical support to private sector um, individuals, owners and operators, um, to help them with risk assessment, with mitigation, with restoral um, and response activities. It is also our mission to provide general awareness um, to the broad uh, public. Um, and finally, as Mr. McGurk will discuss, to provide national coordination in response um, across the board. It is, as I said, not an environment where a single solution works or a single organization um, provides all of the answers. It is an environment where much progress has been made and it is a team sport for us all. Um, cooperation between law enforcement, between intelligence uh, agencies, between the Homeland Security, between, as I said, government and private sector, it's a significant part of how we need to move forward of, of the successes we've had to date. Examples such as, uh, as you pointed out, the compromise in RSA um, really helps demonstrate the progress that has been made in government, the response that we had in that defined a set of, uh, worked across a set of responsibilities defined in the National Cybersecurity Incident Response Plan, where law enforcement has responsibility for pursuit and for investigation, where intelligence has warning responsibilities and attribution responsibilities, and where Homeland Security's responsibilities are in protection, prevention, restoral, and response. Um, and that partnership across government is so important for us as we work through each of the events that occurs. Um, we have, in a proactive manner, responded to 100 requests from critical infrastructure partners, largely across water, oil and gas, um, and power, to help identify uh, vulnerabilities in their environments and help them improve the capabilities that they have for protection and for response. It is through that partnership that we continue to work uh, to uh, enhance our prevention uh, activities because as we've said, as, as we said, we are in that untenable environment today. What we have also put a great deal of effort in is to increase visibility and information sharing across environments. And, and again, we'll, um, I, I look forward to the comments of Mr. McGurk in our operations center. But it's, it's information sharing, not only in operations and in response, but information sharing writ large that's important uh, across the board. And so in conclusion, I look forward to further questions from the committee to discuss what we've done. And it again is my pleasure to be here today. Thank you, uh, Mr. McGurk. You're welcome for your opening statement. Thank you, Chairman Stearns, uh, Ranking Member get and distinguished members of the subcommittee. My name is Sean McGurk. I'm the director of the National Cybersecurity and Communications Integration Center, also known as the NKIC. Uh, thank you for inviting me here today, along with my distinguished co colleagues, to discuss the overall cyber risk to critical infrastructure. The department greatly appreciates the committee's support for our essential mission and looks forward working with the committee to establish the necessary uh, plans and programs moving forward to address risks to the critical infrastructure. The cyber environment is not homogenous under a single department or agency, nor under the private sector. Each of the 18 critical infrastructure and key resource sectors are completely different. Energy, water, nuclear, transportation, they all have their unique challenges and their unique environments. In fact, within a particular company, two plants may not have the same operating environment. We rely on this continuous availability of a vast and interconnected critical infrastructure to sustain our way of life. A successful cyber attack could potentially result in physical damage and even loss of life. We face a significant challenge moving forward, strong and rapidly expanding adversary capabilities and a lack of comprehensive threat and vulnerability awareness. Support of these efforts for, from our private sector partners is key to securing these critical infrastructures. The government does not have all the answers, so we must work with the private sector to establish those guidelines. There's no one-size-fits-all solution in a cyber environment. There is no cyber Maginot line. We must leverage our expertise and our access to information along with the in industry's specific needs, capabilities, and timelines. Each partner has a role and a unique capability as demonstrated by the diversity of this panel. 
two factor authentication was mentioned earlier the r s a example in that particular example within a twenty four hour period the department working along with law enforcement and with the intelligence community responded to a request from the private industry partner to provide a mitigation identification and assessment team in support of their mitigation efforts the department continuously works with our private sector partners in the financial services sector energy sector communications i t and others to prepare prevent respond recover and restore coordinating the national response to domestic cyber emergencies is the focus of the national cyber incident response plan and indeed the end kick the what and the how of a cyber attack is the focus and and the uh... intent of our mitigation activities the who and the why usually come later the end kick works closely with the government and um, at all levels and private sector to coordinate and integrate a unified cyber response sponsoring uh... security clearances for our partners enable them to participate fully in our watch center environment to date we have physical representation from the commercial uh, from the communications sector and its information sharing and analysis center from, and also with companies such as AT&T, Verizon, and Sprint. The information technology sector is represented physically on the watch floor, along with the financial services sector, NERC, and representing the, the North American Energy Reliability Corporation, representing the um, uh, energy sector, information sharing and analysis center. And most recently, we've begun to coordinate and share information with the National Electric uh, Sector Cybersecurity Organization, or NESCO. We have the uh, virtual connections as well as physical connections with these organizations and we share data in near real time. Additionally, we have a physical representative from the multi-state ISAC enable us, enabling us to provide actionable intelligence to state, local, tribal, and territorial governments and their representatives. Each of these partners bring a unique perspective and a u unique capability to the watch environment. Currently within our legal authorities, we continue to, con to engage, collaborate with our partners, and provide analysis, vulnerability, and mitigation assistance to the private sector. We have experience and expertise in dealing with the private sector in planning, steady state, and crisis scenarios. We've deployed numerous incident response teams and assessment teams that enable us to prevent uh, and to respond and recover and restore to cyber impacts. Finally, we work closely with the private sector and our interagency partners in law enforcement and intelligence to provide the full complement of capabilities from the federal standpoint in preparation for and response to significant cyber incidents. Chairman Stearns, Ranking Member Deget, and distinguished members of the subcommittee, let me conclude by reiterating that I look forward to exploring opportunities to advance the mission in collaboration with the subcommittee and my colleagues in the public and private sector. Thank you again for this opportunity to testify and would be happy to answer your questions. Thank you. Mr. Wilshinson. Chairman Stearns, Ranking Member Deget, and members of the subcommittee, thank you for the opportunity to testify at today's hearing on the cybersecurity risk to the nation's critical infrastructure. But before I begin, if I may, Mr. Chairman, I'd like to recognize uh, Mike Gilmore, uh, Cammie Corbett, and Lee McCracken, who's sitting behind me, and also um, Brad Becker from our Denver office, who are responsible for their significant contributions in uh, reviewing this area and helping me prepare this testimony today. Well, I'm glad you did. Thank you. Uh, critical infrastructures and our systems and assets, whether physical or virtual, so vital to our nation that their incapacity or destruction would have a debilitating effect on our national security, economic well-being, and public health and safety. They include, among other things, banking and financial institutions, telecommunications networks, and energy production and transmission facilities, most of which are owned by the private sector. These infrastructures have become increasingly interconnected on, and dependent on interconnected networks and systems. And while the benefits of this interconnectivity have been enormous, they can also pose significant risks to the networks and systems, and more importantly, to the critical operations and services they support. In my testimony today, I will describe the cyber threats confronting critical infrastructures, recent actions by the federal government to identify and protect these infrastructures, and ongoing challenges to protecting them. Mr. Chairman, our nation's critical infrastructures face a proliferation of cyber threats. These threats can be intentional or unintentional. Unintentional threats can be caused by equipment failures, software upgrades and or maintenance procedures that inadvertently disrupt systems. Intentional threats include both targeted and non-targeted attacks from a variety of sources, including criminal groups, hackers, insiders, and foreign nations engaged in intelligence gathering and espionage. 
First, recent reports of cyber attacks and incidents involving cyber reliant critical infrastructure underscore their risks and illustrate that they can be used to disrupt industrial control systems and operations, commit fraud, steal intellectual property and personally identifiable information, and gather intelligence for future attacks. Over the past two years, the federal government has taken a number of steps aimed at addressing cyber threats and better protecting critical infrastructures. For example, a cyberspace policy review identified 24 recommendations to address the organizational and policy changes needed to improve the current U.S. approach to cybersecurity. DHS updated the National Infrastructure Protection Plan in part to provide a greater focus on cyber issues and issued an interim version of the National Cyber Incident Response Plan. It also conducted CyberStorm 3, a cyber attack simulation exercise intended to test elements of the National Response Plan. In addition, DHS, uh, as you know, created uh, the National Cybersecurity and Communications Integration Center, or NCIC, to coordinate national response efforts as well as work directly with other private and public sector partners. Despite these threats, more needs to be done to address a number of remaining challenges. For example, implementing the recommendations uh, made by the President's Cybersecurity Policy Review, updating the national strategy for securing the information and communications infrastructure, strengthening the public-private partnerships for securing cyber-reliant critical infrastructures, enhancing cyber analysis and warning capabilities, and securing the modernized electricity grid. In summary, the threats to information systems are evolving and growing, and systems supporting our nation's critical infrastructures are not yet sufficiently protected to consistently thwart the threats. While actions have been taken, federal agencies in partnership with the private sector need to act to improve our nation's cybersecurity posture, including enhancing cyber analysis and warning capabilities and strengthening the public-private partnerships. Until these actions are taken, our nation's critical infrastructure will remain vulnerable. Mr. Chairman, this concludes my statement. I'd be happy to answer any questions from you or other members of the subcommittee. I thank the gentleman. Uh, let me ask you a question. I have your opening statement here in which you mentioned various cybersecurity attacks. Are these primarily, they're putting software viruses into the network? Is that primarily what it is? It could be a number of different attacks in terms of one, to include in computer intrusions in which it was able to, uh, individuals are able to gain access through the um, installation of malicious software. For example, if a user inadvertently plugged in a USB port into his computer that was corrupted, it could install some malicious software which might facilitate an, an attack. Uh, it could now when an attack occurs, mm -hmm. Generally, what does that attack look like? They're coming in to steal information, or are they coming in to put in a replicating software that will destroy it, or is it just putting in there to observe? What, what, what is the th of those it could three? Be any, it could be any of the combinations. Any of those three actually, combinations. Right. You know, to one, in terms of either to sabotage this particular system or gain information for future attacks, perhaps, or as well depending as Depending upon their motivation. Depending yeah. upon their motivation. Mr. McKirk, what, Kirk, what do you think? Uh, Yes, sir. I, I would also echo um, my colleague's statements that uh, the vast array of, it, of uh, capability that we see demonstrated with the malicious code is, is such that it, in, it encompasses all of those things. Mr. Chairman, you had mentioned Stuxnet earlier. That's a great right. example of a particular piece of malicious code that demonstrated very unique capabilities. It not only um, uh, exploited what we call zero-day vulnerabilities, which are vulnerabilities that are not known um, in, in, in the uh, public environment, but also it used advanced communications capability. It did advanced reconnaissance, so it was gathering information. And subsequently, it left behind that malicious code that was able to have a physical impact. Now, is, are we in the United States, uh, you know, we have jurisdiction over energy, water, information, technology, communication, and nuclear plants. Are we vulnerable to uh, Stuxnet, in your opinion? So, so, sir, because of the ubiquitous nature of information technology in the critical infrastructure, 
the exploitation may occur in one sector and it could actually migrate into another sector so yes or no do you think we're vulnerable i would say the vulnerabilities exist and the exploitation of the and the capability to exploit those vulnerabilities exist ok so the big question is the american people want to know what has the united states government done about that to make sure we don't have that attack much of the department's focus over the past several years has been on mitigating the vulnerabilities associated with those critical infrastructure systems we have to do it by having uh, an oculus or uh, something that uh, inoculates us from the software or do you do it to make sure you don't put the usb port or, or how, how are you doing this so, to protect so it's that? a multi uh, faceted appro approach sir M much of it is through an education program so we work with the private sector to develop uh, standards required to, to educate the community on, on good practices and, and uses of equipment and technology. We actually conduct... Do um, you think education alone would do it? Then? No, sir. We also conduct um, vulnerability analysis of products in our laboratories in conjunction with the National Laboratory uh, community, where we actually take vendors' products and do a complete vulnerability assessment of those products. We also develop practices for asset owners and operators because in some cases, especially in the power companies, it's not a matter of replacing the technology. So you have to be able to put practices in place that mitigate the risk. And they're also working with the um, security communities to actually provide an enclaving capability right. so that we can secure the environments around which they operate. So by taking this multifaceted approach, we can identify not necessarily the threat actors and focus on the threats, which are coming from many areas, but the vulnerabilities themselves and mitigating the risks associated with those vulnerabilities. Yeah, let, me, let me ask you a question. But uh, with this uh, stuck neck, what have we done to protect those specific vulnerabilities in Siemens product? In other words, has DHS issued a guidance on this? Yes, sir. The, the department, when we started analyzing Stuxnet back in July of last year, we identified the capabilities of the particular uh, piece of malcode. We understood its capabilities, and subsequently we put mitigation plans in place at working with the specific sectors to identify the mitigation strategies associated with that. But since that particular piece of malcode was looking for a very unique combination of hardware and software, uh, it was it was easy to identify what the mitigation strategies would be. Okay, uh, Ms. Uh, Stemfley, uh, just last Friday, the head of U.S. CERT resigned. U.S. CERT is a group charged with collaborating with state and local governments and private industry on cyber attacks. There have been a number of recent attacks on government systems, the Senate, FBI, CIA, and even the Gmail hacking aimed at top government officials. Have all of these recent attacks caused any change of direction or change in operation in U.S. CERT? No, sir. Um, the U.S. CERT set of responsibilities stays the same, and as we commented in the opening statements and your opening statements as well, this is a very sophisticated environment, and it is constantly evolving. And as a part of that evolution, we have we, we understand that we have to have a bench and a mechanism for growth of individuals as we go forward. And so um, Randy's uh, departure was a decision that he made, and we have a continued direction and focus in prevention preparedness and restoral responsibilities across the board. What were the vulnerabilities that allowed these systems to be infiltrated, and do these same kind of vulnerabilities exist in the private sector and on control systems? Uh, I'm sorry, sir. Could you repeat the question? It, with regard to the Senate, FBI, and CIA, yeah. CIA, and even the Gmail hacking aimed at top government officials, uh, what were the vulnerabilities that allowed these systems to be infiltrated? There were a number of vulnerabilities that were associated with these uh, these kinds of events that occurred. Um, and uh, to respond to were th are other members of the private sector potentially vulnerable, I believe that is a true statement. As we commented um, earlier, there are a great deal of uh, vulnerabilities that exist in the environment. And you'll see that through the production of warning products and awareness notifications, uh, we provide mitigations and indicators for private sector owners and operators to put in place in their infrastructure. It is a, a shared responsibility between us and uh, the private sector in order to implement the restorative and preventative measures. Thank you. My time has expired. Gentlelady from uh, Colorado. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Um, I want to go a little bit more in depth into some of the issues uh, that we face trying um, to work on interoperability between um, our governmental agencies and uh, private privately owned um, endeavors, in particular with our communications infrastructure, uh, which is, of course, an essential part of our critical infrastructure. 
one of the things i'm concerned about ninety percent of our communications networks are privately owned by commercial carriers so traditionally the f c c has worked with commercial carriers to ensure the reliability of the communications networks and under current f c c rules carriers have to report regarding outages on legacy telecommunications system now the f c c in turn uses this data to help industry standards groups to improve on the best practices so i'm wondering miss templey and and mister mcgurk if you can talk to me for a minute given f c c historical involvement with the communications infrastructure and the relationship with commercial carriers don't you think that they can take an important role in helping drive greater awareness of cyber threats so reporting is always good and the ability to get information about what is going on is an important part of how we can frame that national picture of what's happening and the response activities and so we have a history of working both with private industry directly and with other members of government in order to increase the awareness and the response actions that are necessary I think the same would be true here in addition ma'am what I would like to add is that in response to the to the reporting that's conducted part of the capability that exists within the end kick is our national center for coordination for communications and they receive those direct reports so from a situational awareness standpoint the watch center receives real-time reporting from not not only the telecommunication industry itself but also from other federal departments and agencies so that we better get a better understanding from a holistic view on the impacts the communications because as we recognize that many of the critical infrastructures are relying on communications for controlling issues for communications issues and for flowing of data in addition we have the physical carriers themselves located within the watch environment so that they can provide up to date and actionable intelligence so that we can take the necessary steps and make proper recommendations now um, uh uh, the Office of, of Homeland Security coordinates those efforts on cyber threats and and so I guess my question to you following up is if there's a breach in a communications network then then how how do DHS and FCC respond how do they interact together to respond part of the National Cyber Incident Response Plan includes the um, development and coordination of a cyber unified coordination group or cyber UCG this is a steady state body of emergency response and incident handlers um, at the working level, at the operational level, and then also at the senior decision making level. For our, cy our, our cyber UCG seniors, it encompasses individuals from the departments and agencies that are at the assistant secretariat level or higher. So these are the actual decision makers in the federal government. And then we have a staff which encompasses not only private sector, but the representatives from the federal departments and agencies that coordinate on a daily basis and share real-time information, whether it comes from the, from the communication sector, the energy sector, or one of the other 18 critical infrastructures. So that enables us to have that constant flow of data and provide that actionable intelligence so that private sector companies can take the necessary steps to mitigate risk. Okay. Um, now, as I understand it, the FCC has proposed a rule this spring to extend reporting requirements about network shortages to the broadband network, and they're taking um, public comments on that issue. And so, Mr. Wilshuson, I was I was going to ask you: Do you think that collecting data on broadband outages would help gain a better understanding of when hackers have um, gotten into our systems? Uh, I, we haven't examined that issue, but I would imagine collecting information can only be helpful in making such a determination. Okay. And uh, for the other two witnesses, do you have any thoughts on the potential for reporting um, of broadband network outages to contribute to situational awareness, like if uh, after there's a major emergency, something like that? Yes, ma'am. As uh, I believe, as Ms. Stempley had mentioned earlier, reporting is good and more reporting is even better. So the more information that enables us to develop that common operational picture that, that takes all of the data that we're receiving and then fuses that together. So the more information we receive in the NCIC, the better situational awareness we can provide not only to the, the Secretary of Homeland Security and the other uh, executive secretaries, but also to the President for decision-making uh, capability. Uh, and just one last question relating to, to my opening statement. Um, 
uh, about our communications networks is there's a lot of issues around supply chains for equipment and components that have been manufactured abroad uh, for use in the u s so i'm wondering if our first if these two witnesses on the end is stem play and mr and mr mcgurk can talk about this publicly can you talk about how d h s s working with other federal agencies to address that issue of supply chain that's part of it is foreign so as you pointed out, the telecommunications supply chain activities are an interagency uh, response within the federal government, and we'd be more than happy to bring an interagency body back to, to discuss that in detail. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank the gentlelady. Uh, gentleman from Texas, Dr. Burgess, recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Now, if I understand things correctly, there is a, an authority that exists within the executive branch to take some control of uh, of transmission grid operations in the event of a national emergency. Is that correct? Yeah, either of our DHS witnesses. Yes, sir. The, 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 the Secretary for the Department of Energy has that authority. And is it necessary to place any limits on that authority? Sir, I, I, I'm a, I have the luxury of being a simple sailor and an operator, and I don't normally uh, identify or make recommendations on policy or, or um, operational requirements. I, I, can I can say that uh, within the guidelines that we currently have and the authorities that we currently have, we're able to execute our mission both efficiently and effectively. Um, so I'll leave that uh, to other members of the department to, to comment as far as additional requirements. Ms. Stempley, do you have uh, any thoughts on that? Uh, respectfully, sir, I believe it would be uh, most appropriate for um, DHS not to comment on the legal authorities of another department. Let, well, let me ask you this. Should such an authority be necessary? Should such an occurrence happen that the authority was necessary? How long would you expect that presidential emergency authority to be exercised over a continuous time period? Uh, regrettably, sir, I'm not in a position to answer that question. Well, let me ask you this. Um, it seems like, and I think it was referenced by either the chairman or the ranking member in their opening statements, that we're hearing more and more about this. Does just just reflect the situational awareness that these types of threats and these types of attacks can occur, or is, in fact, this a real phenomenon where the rapidity with which these attacks are coming is is increasing? So it's, uh, believe it's all, all of those things, sir. There is certainly more awareness within the community of uh, the importance of cybersecurity and of the overall activity that is increasing both the detection actions that are occurring and the reporting actions that, that exist. Um, based on that awareness, then uh, what we're seeing is that increase across the board. We're also, as we all uh, indicated in our opening statement, seeing an increase in sophistication of the attacks as they occurred as well. So I believe is a phenomenon of all things, sir. Mr. McCart, do you have any thoughts on that? No, sir, uh, not, not in addition, sir. Uh, the only thing I would add was that uh, because of the uh, adoption of um, information technology um, capabilities into the critical infrastructure, we're also uh, exposing a greater um, landscape of vulnerabilities to areas that were in the past specifically um, closed off and proprietary in nature. So by adopting that technology, we also advance the vulnerability landscape associated with those critical infrastructure um, operations. Well, one of the hazards in this is you're always fighting the last attack. Um, what sort of forward-looking policies or procedures are, are is being implemented by DHS? Are you looking into what is what is the value for whoever the perpetrator is? What is the value that they're deriving from these, and, and are there ways that we could perhaps preempt some of these attacks before they happen rather than just simply reacting to them. So part of uh, what the National Infrastructure or National Cyber Incident Response Plan focuses on is, is moving from the left end of the continuum where we are primarily focusing on response and recovery, which to your point, sir, is accurate. We're always fighting that last event or that last battle. What we're looking forward to uh, working with the private sector is moving to the right and putting the preparedness, the protective, and the preventative measures in place. And we're taking, again, a multifaceted approach through education, through uh, advanced technology, 
working with the ass owners and operators and also with the vendor community to establish criteria for for new systems and new operational parameters the department produces a procurement guideline for ass owners and operators which talks about security requirements for new systems and new operating procedures and we also work closely with the integration community so that we're identifying how to install and how to manage these systems as they're being updated in the critical infrastructure so we are looking at it as a continuum shifting more from the left the responsive part over to the right where we're being preventative and predictive now vast majority of this critical infrastructure is in private hands is that correct that is correct sir so is there any type of analysis as to the cost that may be incurred by the private sector to keep up with what you just articulated yes sir in fact uh, the department identifies and and um, describes a risk as an equation of threats vulnerabilities and consequences uh, when we work with the private sector we understand that the denominator there is also cost so the procurement standards that I had mentioned earlier takes that into account not everything can be a gold standard and we're not we're not saying that you have to have absolute security across the board it's a risk-based approach so we take that same levelized approach and build the business case to identify what we need to implement in what areas so if we're going to spend a dollar to uh, mitigate risk should we focus on the threats or should we focus on mitigating the rest of the vulnerabilities and then what are the subsequent consequences uh, associated with that that's really the, one of the approaches that we're taking in addressing this issue and and do you solicit and accept input from the private sector the owners of the critical infrastructure as to that pricing consideration yes sir as, in fact as the chairman had mentioned earlier uh, one of the things that we focus on is a, n a number of working groups and in the industrial control uh, systems area we actually sponsor a joint public private working group the uh, industrial control systems joint working group ICS JWG which looks at not only mitigating risks but also product development implementation uh, education and a whole host of issues and that is a complete uh, joint environment with both public and private members represented Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'll yield back. Thank you, gentlemen. Uh, Dr. Christensen is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And again, welcome to our panel. Um, under Homeland Security um, Presidential Directive 7, healthcare and public health are identified as critical infrastructure sectors. And of course, it plays, the healthcare sector plays a significant role in response and recovery in the event of a disaster. So I'd like to talk with all of our witnesses about the efforts to protect this sector against cyber threats. Beginning with Ms. Stempley and Ms. McGurk, what do you see as the major challenges to ensuring cybersecurity in the healthcare sector? Ma'am, I, I will begin with um, some of the kinds of policy challenges we've been working through in the federal government um, associated with this. And so, for example, we are working to deploy uh, technological solutions that enable detection and prevention measures in place. Those. Uh, uh, technological solutions oftentimes require a very detailed analysis of the kinds of privacy and protection requirements that need to be put in place that we all feel so strongly about as well. And we need to work through some of those key policy nexuses between the two so that we can take into, um, we can provide that kind of support and prevention support while still being very true to the protection measures that uh, we feel so strongly about in terms of privacy and other areas. Um, those kinds of infrastructure systems are very important to us and we, we, uh, we agree with that. Once we get past the policy questions, then it's a matter of how we employ those both solutions, best practices um, across the board and handle the equally important integrative systems that exist in healthcare um, and have that nexus between IT and embedded systems as well. Any other? Yes, ma'am. I would also mention that um, one of the department's focus is also on the not just the protecting the information in, in accordance with a number of regulations and requirements, but also um, the equipment itself. When we look at the vulnerabilities associated with the other sectors, the healthcare industry also has an equal number of vulnerabilities associated with embedded medical devices or with um, advanced technology that could potentially be exploited because of the inherent communications capability of those devices. So again, the department is taking not just a data in motion, data at rest approach, but a holistic approach to the healthcare industry, working with the private sector, working with the manufacturers of these uh, pieces of equipment, and also with the necessarily federal departments and agencies so that we understand the risks associated with the healthcare industry and provide actionable steps that will better improve 
not only the quality of service, but the quality of life. Thank you, and those focus assessments um, are great. Um, I'm assuming you're working with the Department of Health and Human Services on, as well as with the private sector. And so with, with any of the particular sectors, ma'am, we work very strongly with the sector-specific agency and Health and Human Services specifically in this situation. In fact, ma'am, we have the National Health Information Sharing and Analysis Center coming to visit and tour the NCIC tomorrow in part of our uh, development process to get them physically located on board. So they, they will be actually visiting us tomorrow so that we can identify those connections. Great, great. Mr. Wilshusen, um, I'm also interested in hearing more about GAO's work on cybersecurity issues that affect health and, and public health. As providers use more computer-based mechanisms and programs to help them treat patients, um, and I guess this sort of follows up on, on what you were saying, Mr. Uh, you, you agree that it poses additional risk that the personal health information could be released to the public? Certainly. In fact, we have a couple of engagements that we have ongoing or will start soon. Uh, one it was mandated by the High Tech Act in which GEO is responsible for reviewing the security and privacy protections over information that's transferred and exchanged through the electronic prescription system or e-prescribing. Mm -hmm. Uh, we are uh, we'll anticipate starting that engagement in September with the re report release date on uh, September 2012. In addition, we have another engagement that we're currently working on to look at the security controls and risks associated with embedded or implantable medical devices, such as insulin pumps, pacemakers and that, yeah. that can be accessed through wireless technologies and may have chips in, in place. So we're also examining uh, the secure, reported security risk associated with that, as well as FDA's uh, pre-market and post-market review processes to address those particular risks. Well, thank you. I, my time is running out. I appreciate the information because the ever-increasing use of technology in our healthcare system obviously holds a lot of promise and many benefits, but it also um, increases our, as we increase our reliance on technology, there's also, as you've pointed out very clearly, the opportunity to hack in and interfere with that. So thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm I thank the gentlelady, the uh, gentlelady from Tennessee, Ms. Blackburn, recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Ms. Stempley, I wanted to come with you. Uh, I was just meeting with one of my airports and I uh, wanted to know, TSA, uh, what does the DHS and TSA do with the body images that they collect from the scanners at the airports? How long are they stored? And do you protect these images? Uh, do you share them with any other agency? And what would you do, what action would you take in case you had a breach? Ma'am, the Office of Cybersecurity and Communications is responsible for setting standards that the federal government has to comply with to include TSA. Um, I am not familiar with their specific. Would um, you get back to me on that? I certainly would. Okay, I, I know that uh, it's a part of what we're talking it about, absolutely. and it also pertains to the privacy work that we are doing in our uh, CMT mm -hmm. committee. And I think as we work with some of the issues we're having with TSA, I'd love to have the answer if you could do that. I've got another question. This would be for you and Mr. McGurk. And I mentioned uh, TVA in my opening uh, comments and the amount of coverage that we have with the power security. Um, I want to see what your interface is with the state and local governments and the infrastructure by facilitating the information sharing of the cyber threats and the incidents and through uh, the ISACs. So there are 16 of those ISACs, right? Okay. And very briefly, if you just go through how it works, what kind of information that is shared, what your process would be uh, how you protect the data that you get and what your expectation is of those state and local governments that they're going to protect that data and then what your response would be if you had a breach. Thank you, ma'am. I'd just like to start off by saying that we have a very close working relationship with the Tennessee Valley Authority. Um, in fact, we visited many times and we share uh, real-time information 
through uh, a number of sensor programs that we operate so that we understand a better, have a better understanding of the actual threats and impacts associated with those operational environments. Uh, what we do and how we share that information from the standpoint at the national level is much of the data that is uh, voluntarily submitted to the NKIT comes from either the ISACs themselves, the Information Sharing and Analysis Centers, including the multi-state, or it comes from the private sector companies themselves. Much of that data is submitted under the Secretary's authority for pr the protection of critical infrastructure information, or PCII. That protects that information from being released even to a, a regulator, for instance, if it's a power company and they submit the information to us. Uh, we then take that and we work directly with that company to develop a mitigation strategy that is A, company specific, and then B, we anonymize it to the point where it becomes a sector specific mitigation strategy. The RSA data breach was a great example of how within a short period of time, less than 24 hours of notification of the breach, we had more than 50 companies and federal departments and agencies represented under the Cyber Unified Coordination Group developing, developing sector specific mitigation plans. So those individuals, not only from a physical environment, but also a data sharing environment, collaborate to generate those mitigation plans. Okay, and at what point do you pull state or local government into that to participate? Continuously. So they're represented, okay. they actually have a representative on the floor of the okay. multi-state ISAC. So they're okay. there in real time. All right. Excellent. And ma'am, to uh, continue on in that discussion, we have worked with the 50 states to provide clearances to the chief security officers in each of the states and then share classified information through their fusion centers um, so that that provides not just their representation on the floor in real time around an event, but also gives us an ability to push data okay, to them then, in their states And as then well. are you training, do you do any co-education and training with local law enforcement back into your protocols? Um, the training activity that we provide, all of our training um, is provided on an open basis and so that state representatives can come and participate. I can't speak to which states have chosen to come in with particular law enforcement uh, individuals, but we make it available to them okay. in order for them to pick it. Excellent. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Neil Black. Gentlemen, finished. Uh, Gentle lady uh, from Florida, Ms. Castor, recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you to the witnesses for your insight today. Uh, it's apparent that an effective partnership between the federal government and the private sector is necessary to ensure the security of uh, all of our networks, whether those networks manage critical infrastructure or simply handle the day-to-day -day, uh, data of the federal government and communications. Mr. Will Susan, in your testimony, you noted that the private sector uh, has expressed concerns that DHS is not meeting their expectations in terms of information sharing. What concerns does private industry have about DHS's willingness to provide information? Yes, ma'am. We uh, did a review in which we surveyed 56 individuals uh, from the private sector, from five uh, sect or private sector councils, uh, and we found that they identified a number of key activities that they thought were critical or important uh, for the pri public-private partnership to include the provision of timely and actionable threat and alert information, having a secure mechanism for uh, collecting information or sharing information with the public sector. And they indicated 90, only 27 percent of those respondents indicated that they felt that their public sector partners were actually meeting those expectations to a great or moderate ex extent. And so there are a number of concerns about being able on the part of the private sector to collect timely information from the public uh, sector partners. Were there any particular sectors that, that stood out that appeared to be problematic? Well, from the private sector side, it was pretty much across the board. Uh, the five sectors that were included in our study included the banking and finance sector, the IT structure or sector, the communications, energy, and the defense industrial base sectors. And it was pretty much across the board. Uh, as I mentioned, only 27 percent of the 56 uh, respondents actually felt that they were receiving uh, support. Uh, and to a great or moderate extent. So, Mr. McGurk, what is uh, DHS doing to address these concerns and to ensure uh, that you all are working collaboratively with the private sector? 
Uh, Ma'am, I'd like to start off by saying, you know, can we do better? Absolutely. Uh, we have modified much of the structures by actually standing up and creating the, the NKIC that met some of the requirements moving forward. Uh, by actually having the private sector participate in not only receiving the information but developing the information by having them physically present in the environment really assists us in putting the information in a language that's necessary to reach our constituents. A great example is in the past when we would produce information, we would produce it in a language that we understood and then we would send that out and that may or may not meet the needs of, the, of our private sector partners. By having power engineers and financial services specialists and IT specialists sit physically sitting there working with us and collaboratively developing the knowledge necessary to distribute, we're able to provide actionable intelligence. Just last year we received the report in an intelligence communication of a particularly malicious piece of mail code that had a subject line on an email called here you have. Within a few hours of that appearing in a classified report, the U.S. CERT produced an early warning and notice that went out to the broad private sector because we took that data, declassified it, and provided actionable intelligence for our private sector partners. But by having them there and participating really enables us to provide uh, better products for our partners and also speeds up the time necessary to generate that product. Well, how about the flip side? I'm also curious about how well the private sector is communicating with DHS uh, when they suffer a cyber attack or a breach. Uh, Mr. McGurk, what are private companies uh, required to report cyber attacks or coordinate their responses uh, to, to those attacks with DHS? So th there's no um, requirement to report the information directly to the department, but I think what's happened over the development of the partnership over the past several years is the stigma associated with cyber breaches has started to be removed and companies are volunteering the information because they understand that it not only benefits their ability to maintain goods and services, but it will also assist the broader community because they recognize that when they share with the department, we're not going to publish company specific information. We're going to anonymize that and produce mitigation strategies and plans that help the broad sectors and, and they've been working very closely with us in developing are there, that. Are there instances where DHS has become aware of a cyber attack or a breach on a particular company and then you contacted that company to assist and they've declined your offers uh, to work with them, uh, declined assistance? Yes, ma'am. What can we do about that? How do we improve the, the collaboration and working together? Part of that is, a, is an awareness and an understanding. Uh, from the private sector standpoint, I, I understand that we have to demonstrate value and they have to see where DHS, working with uh, DHS and, and partnering with DHS adds value to their capability. In some cases, in, in those, those particular companies had a very advanced capability. We gave them the early warning notice that they, that they needed to take the necessary steps to protect their networks. So sub subsequently, additional response from DHS wasn't required. And in the extreme case, we received the um, declination for support, but uh, recognition of, of the uh, awareness or the alert. Thank you very much. Thank you, ma'am. Gentleman from Virginia is recognized for five minutes, Mr. Griffith. I'm just curious, uh, Mr. McGurk, under what circumstances, if any, would the DHS uh, NKIC withhold cyber threat information that it has um, uh, in encountered from owners or operators of critical infrastructure? Sir, we, we do not withhold threat information, but subsequently we don't develop threat information. Um, under the authorities of the department, we focus primarily on mitigation of risk, and that's where we focus our activities. Threat act, uh, information is really developed by the intelligence community, and we rely on that partnership with the intelligence community to identify threat actors. All right. Do you, do you have any indication that they may be sometimes withholding information? No, sir. In many cases, what, what is germane to mitigation is not necessarily associated with the actor. It's the activity. So it's the exploitation of the vulnerability which is necessary to share to protect the networks, not who's actually doing it. Mr. Wills Houston, GAO reported in October of 2010 that only two of 24 recommendations by the President's Cybersecurity Policy Review had been implemented and the rest had only been partially implemented. What can you tell us about whether any additional progress has been made? Well, one of the reasons we found that the partial implementation occurred was because many of the agencies were not taking effect uh, because they were not given specific 
roles and responsibilities to implement some of those recommendations and that kind of delayed actions to implementing that we will be following up as part of our annual review follow up on our recommendations to see what extent those recommendations are now being met but we just since we just issued that in October we have not gone back to follow up on our prior recommendations and and to do a reassessment should we expect a an updated report this coming October if you will be updating the status of our recommendations and if you request us to do and we will certainly do it yeah I would be curious since only two of the 24 right were implemented as of last year and and I'm just wondering should we be concerned that so few of the recommendations had been fully implemented at at that time well those implement there are 10 near-term recommendations coming out of that policy a review 14 midterm recommendations several of the midterm recommendations are actions of such a nature that it's going to take multiple years to fully implement those but the near-term recommendations are very important and key and should be implemented as soon as possible all right I thank you yield back my time tell me yields back yes for follow-up I yield for follow-up let me just Dr. Christensen asked some very good questions on the health care aspects of the critical infrastructure and going along with with what the gentleman was just asking as far as those forward-looking threats it seems like we've created some problems for ourselves in the High Tech Act and and some of the things we've done with the information technology infrastructure as applied to health stark laws for example which prohibit the hospitals from putting a wire in a doctor's office if the doctor is not directly affiliated with the hospital so pushing a lot of these vertically integrated systems to go on the internet in order to have the ability to the ease of transfer the data which then renders them vulnerable to attacks on the internet have you looked at that whether whether it perhaps there is something that could be done on the policy side to lessen the impact of the of the vulnerability if if we were to to make some changes on the regulatory side a closed loop if you would between a hospital and a group of doctors even though they are not all part of the same business model might be one way to do that have you explored that at all so your example is a wonderful example of furthering the pendants between the infrastructures as they go forward no it's an example of how we make things harder than they need to be in the first place and then we got to do a whole bunch more stuff to make it workable in the real world but continue thank you sir the specific reviews technical reviews of proposals is not something that we've we certainly do what we work towards our best practices for the kinds of separation and containment that might be necessary in order to understand the environment each of the owners and operators has a better understanding of the risks in their particular environment in the business models that best serve them in each of these cases and so the set of best practices are an important part of how we do this but do we look at the regulations that we the federal government have put in place that make it harder for people to do the right thing in the real world Um, so I'm not sure I can say that specific regulation was reviewed prior to in order to understand the uh, potential implications across the board but we do look at regulations and, and procedures as they come well, I appreciate the gentleman from the yielding with times expired let's let's look at that going forward I yield back thank the gentleman uh, Ms. Shikowsky is recognized for five minutes thank you um, have uh, any of you the three of you uh, read Stieg Larson's book the uh, girl with the dragon tattoo etc yes we have uh, if you if you haven't people who are into cybersecurity would not only enjoy them but probably be a little worried about it the um, pretty flawed heroine Elizabeth Salander um, can seem to there, there's no firewall too high or wide or low to that she can't uh, that she can't get through um, and I think it's it's really uh, she is the heroine, the uh, sort of the, the good guy, um, but the the notion of individual actors out there who have this uh, tremendous capacity to um, infiltrate, I think, is a real concern. I sit also on the intelligence committee, and we think about that a lot. So here's what I I, I wanted to ask: Do do we employ sort of old school kinds of techniques like redundancy? 
um, to, to make sure. I remember sitting in a hotel room and, and watching a rolling blackout in Ohio a number of years ago, which turned out to be a, a failure of the grid and not some sort of attack. This was post 9-11, but felt like it, it might have, have been. So um, do, do, we, do we build in things like we do in aircraft or whatever that just redundancy so we're not as vulnerable? Can someone answer? Yes, ma'am. Um, I, I do agree that um, one of the salient points of the book was that they were focusing on perimeter defense as a method of ensuring their security. And as you quite adequately pointed out, that uh, there was no wall t too high or too thick that she couldn't get through in the process. And subsequently, that's why the department doesn't look at only a perimeter defense strategy as part of enabling a, a, a sound cybersecurity profile. We look at a defense in depth strategy so that there's layers upon layers of security implemented. Um, in addition, we want to focus on the practices and the procedures to address the various risk associated with operating those networks, whether it's from insider activity, whether it's from nation state sponsored, whether it's criminal activity. We treat the act separate from the actor so that we can understand what they're trying to exploit as far as the vulnerabilities. So that's the approach that the department takes. And we do work very closely with the intelligence community, law enforcement community, and the private sector to develop those necessary strategies so that we can have a better and more secure defense posture. L let me ask a, another question. There's a lot of talk and even advertising about how um, we can centralize um, data management and storage and, uh, and, and concentration, um, uh, and then you can access that without individual servers and all kinds of, of things to make business more efficient, et cetera. I, I'm wondering if this creates a new layer then of vulnerability, if everything is sort of outsourced to one place. The, um, the what I call re-architecting moments that are going on in the environment, things like the movement to cloud computing and mobility, are a challenge <laughs> and an opportunity at the same time. So there certainly um, are vulnerabilities that exist in that environment that must be addressed as we architect to move things uh, there. But it isn't a, isn't generally a lump sum, just pick up and move. There are design considerations that must be taken into account as you move. And so they are these opportunities for um, individuals to look at how they both handle their data procedurally and how they protect it through this defense in-depth approach um, across the board. Great. And if I may add, um, we did a review over the cloud's computing security and identified a number of both positive as well as negative security implications of going to the cloud computing. Particularly of the negative sort is just agencies lose control over the access to their data, who has access to it, uh, as well as the ability of agencies who are still responsible for the protection of that information to assure themselves through independent testing or other evaluations that their cloud service provider is actually implementing a security effectively over their environment and the information. And those are still issues that are still being worked out. Uh, the federal government uh, through GSA, uh, I don't, I'm not sure if DHS is involved with this, OMB, and others are setting up different procedures through FedRAMP and some other programs to try to address some of those areas. Um, I, I started by talking about this rolling blackout that I, that I saw. I, I wondered if we can talk about how secure our power grid um, really is. I, I don't know if you uh, addressed that uh, earlier. Um, there was a, uh, the Aurora project, is that Mr. Yeah, Mr. Gerg, um, that, that showed the effect of hacking into a power plant's control station via computers and, and digital d devices. So I'm just wondering how we, how that came out and, and if we are, if there are vulnerabilities that we're correcting. Yes, ma'am. The, uh, the purpose behind uh, the Aurora um, evaluation and experiment that was conducted by the department in conjunction with the Idaho National Lab back in 2007 was essentially identifying the interdependencies between the critical infrastructures. That's how it started out. We wanted to see if we could have a negative impact in an environment by attacking the capabilities or the equipment of another environment. Uh, for instance, if I, if I destroyed the generation cap capability, could I then have an adverse impact on a data storage center or an airport 
or some other physical infrastructure so subsequently we took a look at the the interconnected nature of these devices and we conducted a series of experiments that identified the capability by modifying settings and accessing control networks to actually take a digital protective circuit and turn it into a digital destructive circuit um, a simple explanation of what we did with Aurora, it's like you're driving down the road at 60 miles an hour and you throw your transmission in reverse. It's going to have a negative impact on that, yeah. that car to operate. So and that's really what we were trying to demonstrate. And then subsequently, once we identify the vulnerabilities, how do we put those protective measures in place, whether it's through equipment design and modification, or in many cases, it's just through procedural changes. So we look at low cost or no cost approach. And that from, from that point forward, the department has conducted numerous equipment vulnerability assessments to not only identify inherent vulnerabilities in the devices, but to work with industry to develop those mitigation strategies. And in some cases, working with the manufacturers to physically modify the equipment so that it's more secure. Thank you. My time is well expired. Thank you. The gentleman from Louisiana, Mr. Scalise, recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. If I could ask uh, all the panelists first, just want to get your opinion on uh, if our critical networks are more vulnerable today than they were five years ago. So, so my opinion is they are not necessarily more vulnerable than they were five years ago. A great deal has happened over the last five years in terms of coordination, collaboration uh, across the board. What I believe is that we are much more aware um, now than we were five years ago, both of the role that they play in the environment. We are certainly more dependent on cybersecurity solutions um, and interdependent today, um, more aware of that, and there is a higher um, sophistication in the threat uh, that exists today than did some time ago. Mr. McGurk. Thank you, sir. I, I would also agree that uh, I believe that it's been an, a, an evolutionary period. Uh, perhaps in the past we were, we, we, were, we were focusing more on information assurance as a method of achieving cybersecurity, but since then we've recognized that since the physical and the virtual are all interconnected, we're taking a more direct approach towards cybersecurity, so there may be more reporting but there's more awareness as well. And I would also say that the threats to cyber uh, critical infrastructures are increasing. Uh, they're evolving and growing and becoming more sophisticated. So those two uh, raise their overall risk to those infrastructures. Uh, our reviews have shown that uh, when we have e evaluated the security over specific systems, that they are vulnerable and that numerous vulnerabilities exist uh, because appropriate information security controls, which are well known, have not been implemented on a consistent basis throughout. So while there's greater awareness, there's also a greater threat, I believe, and also the vulnerabilities still remain. Okay. Um, Mr. Walsh, uh, in your testimony, uh, the GAO, and you list in here the, some GAO recommendations uh, to enhance the protection of cyber-reliant critical infrastructure. Uh, regarding these uh, these recommendations that you laid out, uh, do you see that other agencies are uh, are looking at these or open to these, and, and specifically with with the members of uh, DHS that are here? And you know, I'd like to get their take too. But what has been your the reaction you've seen uh, from the GAO report of these specific recommendations? Well, for most of our reports in this area, we have received largely concurrences with their recommendations, particularly from DHS. Uh, they have taken a number of actions uh, to implement our recommendations, and we will be following up with them to assure that they're effectively implemented over time. Uh, in some cases, even when DHS non-concurred for the purposes of our report with the recommendation, they ultimately uh, reversed themselves and, and decided to implement the recommendation. So I think there's awareness and action uh, and concurrence on the most part of the agencies to implement our recommendation. I'll ask the same, Mr. McGurk and Ms. Stempley, just uh, both those recommendations, but also other tools that, that you think should be available. I, I would like to add that uh, in addition to the recommendations from GAO, and we do evaluate them not only from a technical uh, standpoint, but also from an implementation standpoint, and that's part of the challenge that, that we identified. In the critical infrastructure, the networks are so, in some cases, unique that you can't apply a particular standard or requirement um, that is identified by a recommendation and actually have an interop, you, you may actually cause an interoperability um, challenge. 
so we do look at that from a technical standpoint and then we work with other standard setting bodies such as nist to identify those best practices and those requirements and then work with the private sector to ensure that we can actually implement that without causing an adverse impact or additional cost mr so we agree that the recommendations in the ga report are ones that we we focus a great deal of attention on and recognize that cyber is one of the high risk items that uh... geo executes we have a regular interaction with them around um, this particular activity particularly given the consequences we talked a great deal about consequences of uh... Um, act of malicious activity in this particular environment. We watch very closely that, um, and as we work through issues both in terms of um, owners and operators, execution and implementation of practices in their environment, and come out um, as we're requested to come out and provide voluntary review of um, information and, and um, infrastructures in the owner operator sites, we're also able to identify how they're doing in terms of implementation and get information about what is a generally accepted practice okay, across the board. Real quickly, one final question before my time runs out. Uh, the Department of Defense's uh, Director of Intelligence and Counterintelligence has talked about supply chain integrity, and, and uh, you know they suggest that uh, the, some equipment that we buy, hardware that we buy, could be corrupted, both hardware and software. Uh, and there are some things that they're looking at in that regard. And I wanted to get your take uh, from Homeland Security. And if GAO wants to chime in, is that something that y'all have looked at as well? Have you seen any problems there? So, so I believe uh, I made an offer earlier to bring back an interagency review around supply chain. We um, appreciate that it is important for us to look across the entire life cycle of both equipment and of software um, development as well um, so that we can make sure that we have good practices in each of the steps of the life cycle. And if I may chime in, uh, we are currently evaluating uh, the supply chain risk process of, at several agencies, including DOD, DHS, Justice, Energy, uh, as part of our, our review over the supply chain risk uh, for IT. We're assessing also the agency's efforts to employ a risk-based approach to assessing supply chain risks. Right. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. You're back. Thank you. The gentleman from Texas, Mr. Green, is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And following up our colleague from Tennessee, Ms. Blackburn, you know, our committee has jurisdiction both over cybersecurity and uh, in health care. And so when we go through those screenings, could we at least maybe in our jurisdiction have a radiologist look at those so we can do those full body scans and it maybe save us on our imaging cost? But uh, I want to welcome our panel here. Uh, it's been a long hearing for y'all, and I thought we ought to laugh a little bit. Um, the GAO has long identified protecting the federal government's information system and nation's cyber critical structures. And Mr. Wusherson, when did the GAO first identify cybersecurity as part of our high-risk series? That was back in 2003. Okay. And you did your first major review of DHS cybersecurity efforts in 2005? That's right. That's when we assessed the, the, the department's performance in actually implementing some of the 13 roles and responsibilities that it was responsible for. Have you seen improvements in the way that the federal government prepares for and addresses cyber threats since you've been reviewing the DHS's program? We've seen progress at DHS in the way that it is addressing some of these areas. Uh, we also recognize that there's uh, more needs to be done, particularly with some of the sector's uh, specific planning efforts, uh, its cyber analysis and warning capabilities, as well as just, as I mentioned earlier, related to its uh, partner, private-public partnerships. Okay. I understand that in 2009, DHS launched a 24-hour DHS-led coordinated watch and warning system known as the National Cybersecurity Communications Integration System. Um, did... Uh, Mr. McGirt, what private sector entities have currently access to the resources at this facility? Sorry, sir. Currently, uh, we, we have a direct partnership with each uh, of the 18 critical infrastructure and key resource sectors physically located on the watch floor today. We have representatives from the energy sector, the financial services sector, the communications sector, IT sector, multi-state ISAC, uh, 
we are also finalizing agreements with chemical and others so they can be physically present on the watch floor in addition we recognize the unique capabilities of some of our other partners in the manufacturing and anti virus environment and we're working with with them to develop cooperative research and development agreements so they could be physically present so that we can share data in real time last week there were reports emerge about a department home and security report insider threat to utilities and when you mentioned utilities were involved in it you have pretty well unanimous support or working relationship with our utilities in our country from investor owns municipal owns co-ops like the TVA even is that pretty well uniform throughout the country yes sir we have very direct connections with many of the our private sector partners we have spent a lot of time developing cooperative agreements with for instance there's a organization that is made up of the 18 largest utilities in the United States and they have a chief information security officer panel which we interface with directly I've personally briefed them on a number of occasions and provided input into those organizations that they have a better cyber awareness okay I know the report was not released to the public and in the news story talk about we have a high confidence in our judgment that insiders and their actions pose significant threat to the infrastructure and information systems of US facilities and I understand like I said the reports not made public I'd like to ask some questions about insider threats to our utilities miss step line could utility facilities be targets for terrorists on cyber side we know physical targets so I think you'll find that uh, the vulnerabilities that exist and are possible to be exploited exist in many places to include uh, utilities across the board. That's one of the reasons why, as, as we've reiterated, we try to look at this from a common approach uh, across the environment. Okay. In our area, in Texas and Houston, we have mostly investor-owned utilities, our service provider, CenterPoint, and I know they have uh, doing some really great things. Uh, but. Do they have access? Uh, does access to these sensitive facilities, mostly owned by the private companies, need to be closer guarded and carefully monitored to protect these threats? So, uh, best practice activities in the cybersecurity systems are ones of multiple layers of defense, uh, which would include not just perimeter defense, but internal architecture. Um, approaches that uh, separate sensitive data from each other, rely on identity and other services. Those kinds of best practices, which are widely available, should be employed across the board. Okay. I know a news story last week described an insider sabotage in April in a water treatment plant in Arizona where a disgruntled employee took control of a control room to create a methane gas explosion. What is DHS doing to ensure that these type of insider sabotage, again, whether they're just a one person or, or a a plan uh, what is DHS doing to try and limit some of these uh, insider cyber uh, sabotage as we have uh, identified we continue to provide the kinds of warning products indicators of activities that might be uh, that might uh, be necessary and the kinds of best practice guides for owners and operators to employ in your example it would be up to that particular owner and operator to employ those practices and Mr. Chairman, I would just like to ask one last thing. And do you get pretty well put a good cooperation throughout the country with the utilities? Yes, sir. Absolutely, we get a very, very close working relationship with the utilities. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thanks, gentlemen. We'll uh, quickly go for a second round. We don't have votes, and so I welcome my uh, colleagues if they wish to go have a second round. Um, I'd like to return to the stuck neck issue, if I don't mind. Uh, Mr. McKirk, uh, if you can, just answer yes or no. Do you know how many operators in the industrial controls infrastructure actually implemented DHS's guidance on stuck net? Uh, no, sir. Okay. How many U.S. companies use a type of Siemens industrial controlled products that were the target of, of uh, stuck net attacks? A total number of companies. It's very difficult to quantify, sir, because we don't have visibility into all of their networks, but there were approximately 300 companies that had some combination of hardware and software. So 300 U.S. companies. Yes, sir. Approximately. Good. Do you believe that if the U.S. companies implemented the DHS guidance on uh, Stuxnet, they will be able to fend off a future attack from this uh, software? Yes, sir. From this particular piece of malcode? Uh, in addition uh, to this software, we have heard that there have been other vulnerabilities. Uh, 
identified in industrial control systems including a barest ford vulnerability or exploit does that ring a bell yes or given that stuxnet impact and the other vulnerabilities that exist are you comfortable that our country's industrial control systems are secure from cyber attacks i think it's an evolving threat sir so it we have to continue to move forward and not focus on the previous attacks wasn't the barest ford attack developed by one researcher in about two and a half months is that our background and what does that say about the safety of our system as someone could work with his laptop computer in two and a half months develop something that's vulnerable and um, be used um, would you care to comment yes sir um, what that really highlights is the fact that it's not necessarily attributed to the actor itself but it's the action and the vulnerabilities that we need to focus on because as you um, had mentioned in your opening statement and again when focusing on Stuxnet it's not the capability of the actor that necessarily brings about the consequence it's the actual vulnerability associated that's being exploited and that's really where the department is focusing much of its efforts okay and you say what step has DHS taken to prepare and defend against a, a various forward type of attack to an industrial control system and has this guidance or other direction been issued to the industry the private sector and I'll ask you later go ahead Mr. McCurk. Sir, uh, the, the department has produced a number of specific actions as, and uh, guidance associated with various types of cyber risk and, and cyber threats. But again, not focusing on the actor or the activity, but focusing on the vulnerability and the necessary methods to secure the networks. We actually will not only address that issue, but maybe the next generation issue that, 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 that could occur. Do you actually talk to the uh, these U.S. companies to see how they're implementing and doing this? Yes, sir. In many cases, we're invited to actually do an on-site assessment associated with the vulnerabilities to see how we, they implement the mitigation plans. Well, just approximately, how many do you think you've assessed? Uh, we have assessed uh, approximately um, this past year, we did 53. The year before, we did about 40. These are voluntary assessments. The year prior to that, another 30. So we've done uh, over 100 assessments, voluntary assessments and incident response activities over the past three years. Now, was that uh, oriented toward uh, the Stuxnet, or did, was it also involved with the Barris Ford? It, it's involved with all types of vulnerabilities, not just those two particular instances. Uh, Mr. Uh, Wilshithen, do you mind commenting? Well, in our reviews, we often also focus on the vulnerabilities of systems, because that's what the agencies or the operators can control. They can't always control the threats that come their way, but they can control how well they protect their systems and protect against known vulnerabilities. And so that's one thing that we often look at. And at the systems that we examine at a detailed level, we typically find that they are vulnerable. Um, uh, Ms. Stempley, uh, you had indicated in a question, was five years ago, are we more vulnerable today than we were five years ago? And you seemed to indicate you didn't think so. And uh, I guess the, the question is, based upon what I've just given you, some examples, and how a man in just two and a half months could come up with something that can uh, make our system vulnerable, uh, I guess a question for each panel, can you explain how the cyber threats you're seeing now are different from two or three or five years ago? And I'll start with you, Mr. Stempley. So the, um, the cyber threats now are certainly more sophisticated than they were several years ago. The threats are focused more on um, um, individuals and very specific activities. An example I have used is uh, spear phishing is very targeted to an individual. I received an email not too long ago that appeared to be from my husband um, as a, a situation, and it was about a topic about college um, payment activities, and that was identified and sent to me, and had I clicked on it, it may have been um, something that uh, was malicious. That's a, an example of increased sophistication and increased focus that exists. Um, the number of vulnerabilities that have existed and the kind of model that you presented where a researcher identified a vulnerability and something that is already in existence, that vulnerability had been there from the beginning. It was just recently identified. And so the specific vulnerabilities have not increased in that in that scenario. We're just more aware of it now um, and more able to respond. Our protective measures and protective guidance are about building these um, infrastructures in a way that reduces the exposure of those vulnerabilities and makes it less likely for threat actors to be able to be successful. And uh, Mr. McKirk? Yes, sir. Um, I, I would also agree that, you know, it, it's a matter of awareness and understanding the interconnected natures 
um, of, of the so you of don't the see the cybersecurity is increasing in the last five years? Do I see cybersecurity risk? Threats. Threats. Increasing. Yes, sir, as, as a result of exploiting those vulnerabilities because of the sophistication and also the targeted nature. In the past, we were talking about just basic uh, data exfiltration from a very broad audience. Now we're seeing, in the RSA example that was mentioned earlier, very specific targeted attacks against these aggregation centers. And, and I agree, and I think you'll see, continue to see more blended types of attacks that exploit a number of different vulnerabilities in order to gain access to its target. So you would agree that the cyber threats are more now than they were five years ago? And more sophisticated. Let me just conclude by this question. I, I'm not quite clear myself what this Barris Ford um, software does or did. Can you describe, Mr. McCurt, what it does? Do you know anything about it? Sir, I, I don't have those specific details of the analysis in front of me today, sir, so I couldn't really comment on that. Anybody? No? Okay. All right. Uh, my time's expired. The gentlelady from Colorado. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. First of all, I'd like to ask unanimous consent to put Mr. Waxman's opening statement in the record. Vice unanimous consent, so ordered. Thank you. Um, so we're, uh, uh, this is the perfect segue, actually, to just um, one question I had of clarification. We're all throwing around the words threat, vulnerability, and risk quite a bit today. And uh, Mr. Wilshusen, I'm, I'm wondering as we prepare for um, our subsequent hearings on these topics, you can just uh, basically describe for us whether there's a difference between those three words and what the technical descriptions are. Sure, yes, and there is a difference. Uh, a threat is basically any circumstance or event that can potentially cause harm to an organization's uh, operations, asset, uh, assets, excuse me, personnel, or whatever. A vulnerability is a weakness in the security controls uh, that are over a system or network. And risk, uh, and there's actually a fourth component here before we get to risk, and that's impact. What's the impact that could occur should a threat, either a threat actor or an event, occur, exploit a vulnerability? What's the impact that it could have? And then that, those three of those kind of equate to what risk is. Thank you. Uh, and are they all three things we should be concerned about? Yes, indeed, uh, absolutely. Uh, threats are what you try to guard against. The vulnerabilities are what you try to prevent and, and minimize by taking corrective actions and implementing appropriate security controls. And you do that in such a manner that you minimize the impact should such a security I incident uh, occur. And so, the, yes, it's important to think of all of them. So, so you've heard both me and the chairman and mm -hmm. other members of Congress uh, or other members of this subcommittee talk about this committee's jurisdiction. I'm wondering if there's any particular sectors of our jurisdiction that you think we should look more closely at in subsequent hearings. Well, I think in terms of a, from a cyber perspective, I think right. probably the key sectors would be, would be energy, mm -hmm. electricity, both nuclear and, and other, just because of the interdependencies that they have with other uh, sectors. Uh, IT, uh, finance and banking, uh, and also um, uh, communications would be, the, I think, the four that are probably the most important just because of the interdependencies that they have with the other critical sectors. Great. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I yield Thank you, gentlelady. Uh, I want to thank the witnesses for their participation. They're coming here this morning. Uh, the committee rules provide that members have 10 days to submit additional questions for the record for the witnesses, and with that, the subcommittee is adjourned. system safe. Um, the chairman referred to the cyber attack on RSA, which um, caused compromises to Department of Energy systems that necessitated shutting down internet connectivity for several days, and breaches of Citibank data belonging to hundreds of thousands of customers. Um, anecdotally, at least, it seems like these breaches are becoming more and more frequent. The incidents remind us of the need for vigilance regarding efforts to prevent cybersecurity breaches and respond effectively when they occur, and the importance of congressional oversight in these areas. Um, as the chairman mentioned, I asked um, him earlier this Congress to look into these issues, and I'm really glad that we're going to have a rigorous review of all of the cybersecurity issues.
Um, as the chairman mentioned, we have jurisdiction over a number of key components of our nation's critical infrastructure, including the electrical grid, drinking water system, chemical plants, health care system, and telecommunications activities. In the last Congress, we saw progress in this committee uh, regarding addressing cybersecurity issues in a number of these areas. The committee developed and passed on a bipartisan basis legislation to promote security and resiliency in the electrical po power grid by providing the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission new authorities and providing for Department of Energy assistance to industry to protect the grid against cyber threats and other vulnerabilities. The committee also developed and passed legislation regarding chemical and drinking water facilities to meet ba risk-based cybersecurity performance standards. Cybersecurity issues are complex and evolving and deserve continuing and focused um, attention. One major question is how to best ensure an effective public-private partnership to address cybersecurity threats. The majority of our nation's critical infrastructure is owned or operated by the private sector. While there are incentives for private sector entities to protect the security of their information networks, national security priorities may not always align with priorities and capabilities of the private sector. I know that the Department of Homeland Security witnesses before us today are helping lead the administration's efforts to foster private and public sector cooperation in promoting cybersecurity, and I look forward to hearing their insights on progress that's being made and obstacles that may still exist. Another question we have to ask is how to best ensure that the federal government is drawing on its own expertise and experience to ensure cybersecurity measures are appropriately tailored to address specific needs in different critical infrastructure sectors. I look forward to hearing from GAO about these challenges. But even with a maximally effective partnership among federal agencies, state and local governments, and the private sector in our country on cybersecurity protection, we must still address issues raised by the fact that information networks do not have national boundaries. Many reports suggested that the cyber attacks have started outside of American borders, raising serious questions about how we ensure international cooperation to protect against threats that cross borders. And in this, in this DOD example um, in the GAO report today, apparently the cyber attack came from a um, portable computer, a laptop computable computer that was somehow um, uh, tapped into. And so I look forward to the insights of today's witnesses on these and other issues. I hope that we will build on this hearing with additional hearings on cybersecurity. It's one of the few bastions of bipartisanship left around here this week, and I'm happy to be part of it. I yield back. Thank you, General Laney. Recognize the gentleman from Texas, uh, Dr. Burgess, for two minutes. I thank the chairman. Um, to say that this committee has been working diligently for years is kind of an oxymoron, but it does seem through through several terms on this subcommittee, we have indeed delved into this issue. I'm anxious that we bring this to a legislative conclusion and institute those things that will provide the protection that I think we all feel that we need. There are critical, urgent things that need to be done to protect our transmission grid, our power plants from attacks from those who wish to do us harm. The threats are real. It is time to move the legislation forward. We do have to be careful that we don't unduly shift the balance of responsibility that has been properly maintained between the government and the private sector for decades. It is important that we be careful. It's important that we be prudent in providing the federal government any additional authority. If indeed any is necessary, it must be done in a way that cannot be abused and will not result in significantly higher cost to consumers and businesses at a time when the economy is so fragile and it must not result in the loss of any personal freedoms that people now have. The testimony we hear today will help this committee in perfecting legislation that was considered last year. I certainly look forward to working on members of both sides of the dais to ensure that the legislation is mindful of both the real threats that we face and the burdens that granting new powers to the federal government can create. Ensuring this balance can and should be done. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for the recognition, and I'll yield back my time. Gentleman yields back, and uh, the gentlelady from Tennessee, Ms. Blackburns, re recognized for two minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I want to welcome our witnesses. We appreciate that you would take the time.
and come over here to the Hill. We all do know and do agree that cybersecurity is an important issue, and we know that there are those who are, as we speak, waging war, if you will, on our vital infrastructure. Uh, last month, Wall Street Journal reported that the IMF was investigating a recent cyber attack. Not surprisingly, this attack came just one month after a group called Anonymous indicated its hackers would target the IMF website in response to the strict austerity measures in its financial package for Greece. Closer to home in my state of Tennessee resides our nation's largest public power utility, the Tennessee Valley Authority. To coordinate working groups and information sharing and analysis centers, or ISACs, in the individual critical infrastructure sectors and in cross-sectors working groups. DHS is primarily responsible for conducting threat analysis and issuing warnings about cyber threats so that other federal agencies and the owners and operators of critical infrastructure can simply protect their systems. DHS's efforts to protect our critical infrastructure have been the subject of some criticism. Since 2003, the Government Accountability Office has designated, quote, protecting the federal government's information systems and the nation's cyber critical infrastructure, quote, as a high-risk, end quote, area. In particular, in a report issued last, G last July, GAO has found that public and private sector owners and operators of critical infrastructure were not satisfied with the kind of cyber threat information they were getting from DHS. GAO has also expressed some concern that the sector-specific plans for dealing with cybersecurity need to be updated. In light of growing and more sophisticated cyber attacks, this is obviously a critical issue. As I mentioned previously, this is the subcommittee's first hearing in this Congress on critical infrastructure protection and cybersecurity. The purpose of this hearing, in particular, is to get an overview of DHS's role and responsibilities and how it coordinates with the sector-specific federal departments and agencies, many of which are subject to this committee's jurisdiction. Once we have a better understanding of DHS's role, it is my intention to call additional hearings to understand the issues that are presented in protecting the individual sectors, such as energy and information systems and communications. Many ideas have been presented about how to improve critical infrastructure protection and cybersecurity. I believe the Oversight Investigation Subcommittee has an important role to play in examining and bringing to light what is working now and what can be done better. I should note that this subcommittee's inquiry into this matter began with a bipartisan letter to the Department of Homeland Security asking for a briefing about its efforts to protect critical infrastructure. I appreciate the support of the ranking member, Mr. Gett, and the minority in this investigation. As members of Congress, one of our foremost responsibilities is protecting our nation's security and the safety of its citizens. With that, I yield uh, opening statement to the ranking member, Mr. Gett. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and um, like you, I'm, uh, this is a matter of great urgency. I'm glad we're having this overview hearing, and I'm also happy to work with the majority on additional hearings into particular issues of cybersecurity. <coughs> um, just today in the Washington Post, it talked about a GAO, here, a, a GAO report on significant breaches of classified computer networks in the Department of Defense. And while that's not while that's not in the jurisdiction of this committee, it just points out how vulnerable this country can be and why it's so important to keep our information. Authority. TVA's power networks stretch across 80,000 square miles in the southeastern U.S. and provide electricity to more than 8.7 million Americans. Under Homeland Security Presidential Directive Number 7, TVA is considered a national critical infrastructure and must take great steps to protect and to safeguard its essential cyber assets. A power grid disruption or other threat on TVA operations or any other public utility in our country would cause a cascading effect impacting our economy, safety, and daily lives. In fact, this concern was reaffirmed last month as former CIA Director and current Secretary of Defense Panetta appeared before the Senate Armed Services Committee and declared that the next Pearl Harbor our nation confronts could very well be a cyber attack 
that cripples our power systems, the grid, our security systems, our financial systems, and our governmental systems. With all that in mind, I thank the chairman for the hearing. I thank you all for your participation as we discuss what steps DHS is taking to avoid what would be the unimaginable, a Pearl Harbor attack on our nation's vital infrastructure. And I yield back. Gentleman lady yields back and uh, recognize Ms. Christensen uh, from the Virgin Islands for, for uh, five minutes. Thank you, Chairman Stearns, and thank you, Ranking Member Duguet, for holding this hearing to discuss cybersecurity risks, threats, and challenges to our nation's critical infrastructure. Many of today's battles are in cyberspace, where terrorists and hackers help attack our cell phones, computer grids, and have the potential to destroy sensitive information And in our 18 of our critical our nation's most critical sectors. Since 9-11, we have known to expect that we would experience terrorist attacks that would be cyber attacks. As a former member of the Homeland Security Committee, I've taken part in many hearings and worked on legislation addressing this issue. As our witnesses who we welcome here today will testify, a lot has been done to create entities to coordinate and oversee efforts to address and prevent cybersecurity threats. But there are still challenges to protecting our nation's infrastructure from these threats, and we must con continue to examine how we can overcome these challenges. In doing so, it's important that we pass legislation to protect our nation's electric grid. All of these long-term initiatives require a national electric grid that is reliable and secure. The electrical grid serves more than 143 million American customers, has to operate without interruption, and is a key foundation of our national security. Designing and operating an electrical system that prevents cybersecurity events from having a catastrophic impact is a challenge we must all address. And I want to add that the healthcare sector is not immune from these attacks either. So I'd like to um, thank DHS and GAO and commend both agencies for their efforts to address imminent cybersecurity threats. And with that, I'll yield back the balance of Gentleman my time, Mr. Chairman. Gentleman lady yields back, and uh, at this time, we'll uh, move to our first. Uh, Good morning, everybody, and the subcommittee will come to order. Um, and I'll start with my opening statement. I've called to order this subcommittee's first hearing on cybersecurity and critical infrastructure protection. Over the last 15 years, our federal government has wrestled with the question of how best to protect our nation's critical infrastructures from cyber attacks. Since September 11th, our infrastructure system have become even more automated and more reliant on information systems and computer networks to operate. This has allowed our system to become more efficient, but it has also opened the door to cyber threats and cyber attacks. Recent reports and news articles have highlighted how threats and risks to cybersecurity have created vulnerabilities in our nation's critical infrastructures in information systems. For example, just last week, the Department of Homeland Security sent out a bulletin about potential insider threats to utilities. That bulletin stated that outsiders have attempted to obtain information about the utilities infrastructure to use in coordinating and conducting a cyber attack. In March 2011, the computer system of RSA were breached. RA, RSA manufactures tokens for secure access to computer networks. Sensitive information about these tokens was stolen and later used to hack into the network of Lockheed Martin, a Department of Defense contractor. Last summer, Stuck, Stuckneck attack was identified. Stuckneck targets vulnerabilities in industrial control systems such as nuclear and energy to gain access to the systems and then manipulate the control process. This kind of attack has a potential to bring down or severely interrupt the functions of an electricity or even a nuclear power plant. The issues surrounding critical infrastructure protection and security are complex. Our systems are interconnected and depend on depend one other depend on one other to operate. A vulnerability in one critical infrastructure naturally exposes other critical infrastructures to the same threats and risk, either, either because they are linked together through information systems or because one infrastructure depends on another to operate. In addition, much of the country's critical infrastructures are privately owned, as much as 80 or 90 percent. 
they therefore have different operations components and control systems and computer networks as well as vastly different resources available to address problems like cyber security and infrastructure protection my colleagues we must have done a fine protect the very systems that make our country run energy water health care manufacturing and communications pursuant to the homeland security act of two thousand to d h s has led the coordination of infrastructure protection efforts with the private and public sectors and numerous federal agencies one way d h s s does this is